There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, a boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, chromium, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Before I go into this dot point in a bit more detail, I want to make sure to let you know that this video and this dot point is quite important. So I've chosen to put it into two different types of videos. The first video covers the anions, the second video covers the cations. Before we start, make sure I need to know, obviously you need to know what an anion actually is and a cation. So they're both forms of ions. Ions are charged particles, so they're not neutral, they have a negatively or positively charged on it. A anion is negatively charged, it's a negatively charged ion, whereas a cation is a positively charged ion. And the ones you need to know for this video are carbonate, which you can see is CO3 2 minus, so it has a negative charge, therefore it's a anion. You need to know about sulfate. SO4, 2 minus, again 2 minus, so it has, an, it has a negative charge, which means it's an anion. Chloride, Cl minus, again negative charge. Phosphate, PO4, 3 minus, therefore these are all anions. And what you have to actually know as well is that if we have cations and anions coming together, so we cover cations in the next video, but if they come together, then they form a salt. And the reason why is because cations come from this part of the periodic table, this part here, these are all generally metals, and they're positively charged, whereas our anions come from this part, which are generally your nonmetals, and when we have a nonmetal and a metal coming together, they generally form, especially ions of those, they form a salt. So if we have, for example, Na, which is sodium, that's right here, so that's a cation, Na+, plus, combining with Cl, Cl is chloride, so chloride is a anion, if they come together, what will happen is we will form NaCl, which is a salt, right? So this is a salt. So this is what you need to know. You need to know that if anions and cations come together, they form a salt. And the actual dot point itself says deduce the ions, that could be either a cation or an anion, present in a sample from the results of tests. So we're gonna, you're going to have tests that you might be given in your, theoretically in your exam or maybe in a lab as well. And you, so you're going to have a sample and you need to do tests to be able to figure out what kind of ions are inside. Right? So this is your sample, and you can see there is different types of colored dots inside. These, we don't know what they are. We need to figure out which kind of ions they are. It could be carbonate, it could be sulfate, it could be chloride, it could be phosphate, or it could be all of them inside that sample. And we have to do tests to be able to figure out exactly which ones are inside. Right? So know that too. Now, the first thing you need to know is you need to know about this actual table. This is a table of solubility. Or this. So this means which ion is soluble with which cation, right? So we've got our ions here. This is our ion section. Uh, sorry, our anions. These are our nonmetals, and these are our cations. So these are our metals. Now some will be soluble with with certain anions, and some will be insoluble. So for example, we said earlier, Na, which is sodium, and chlorine, which is the ion. Both of these are form a salt. In this salt, we can figure that out. Chlorine is our ion here, anion, and it's soluble with most, insoluble with silver, because chlor uh, sodium is not silver, it's part of this most category, which means those two together form a soluble salt. And we show that by having AQ, that means aqueous, right? So that means they have dissolved. So if, for example, you put salt into your water container, right, it will dissolve because sodium chloride has formed and it's aqueous. Now, if, for example, you have um, Ag, which is silver, right? so if Ag, and you also put stick and chlorine in there as well, so chlorine ion, which is your anion, and your Ag ion, which is your cation, those two will actually form an insoluble salt. Right? So that means it's actually not soluble, it's insoluble, which means it forms a precipitate. So pre precipitate is what we call you know, those white dots that appear if something hasn't dissolved. Some of them will be soluble and some of them will not be soluble. And we can actually use that knowledge. So this knowledge we can use to find out which kind of different types of ions are in our sample. Right? So that's what we do this, these tables for. This is what we need to have this information for. So we can use it to figure out what kind of ions are in what kind of solution. Right, so we have our sample here. Again, as I mentioned earlier, in that sample we might have different types of things in it. We don't really know what it is inside. But we can figure that out. And We'll do these four different tests to figure that out. Um, first thing you need to know is you need to know that we need to do them in a certain sequence. Uh, we'll cover why we need to do them in that sequence, but we cover the first part first. So first test 
test for carbonate. So we test for carbonate first, and then after carbonate, we test for sulfate in the second test. After testing for sulfate, we will test for chloride ions, and after chloride ions, we'll test for phosphate ions. Uh, there's a reason why we do that sequence, but you just need to remember we actually do a sequence, and you need to remember these sequences that we're doing in as well. So these four, first carbonate, then sulfate, and chloride ions and phosphate ions. Now we'll, and I'll explain why in a second. But first test we do, right, is we have our unknown solution. So we have this solution here. And what we do is we add some nitric acid. So I wrote one, which corresponds to this one here. And it says add nitric acid. So you can imagine we want to put some nitric acid into it. Now the reason why we can figure out if something happens, if something called an effer effervescence appears, if something called an effervescence appears, that's a bubble. So if gas comes, basically. So if there's a bubble, gas comes, then we know that carbonate is present. And the reason why we know that is because if you put an actual acid into carbonate, what happens when carbonate reacts with an acid? We have carbon dioxide appearing. And carbon dioxide is a form of gas, right? So in this case, we have added nitric acid, which is an acid, into carbonate that reacts to form carbonate in water. That's, that's the normal reaction we'd expect. So here we have carbonate, CO3 to minus, and then we have our hydrogen ion, and that hydrogen ion came from the nitric acid that we put inside, right? Nitric acid are proton donors, which is the same as basically often in most cases as your hydrogen ion. So the hydrogen ion came from the nitric acid. Those two have reacted to form carbon dioxide and water, which is why if we see those bubbles appear, we know that carbon dioxide is present. If they aren't, if they don't appear, that means carbon dioxide is not present, right? That's your first test. After doing a first test, for each test we do, we often do a confirmation test. A confirmation test just means that we make sure that this what we saw is definitely the case, right? So we're just confirming what we just found out, that in this case, the car carbonate is present. So we have this original solution, right? And what we do is we test the, original, the pH of the original solution. So what you can imagine is we put just a pH probe into this solution, figure out what pH it has, or we can use a universal indicator. And if this pH of the original solution, so not the one which has no more gas in it, the original solution, if that it has a pH around about 8 to 11, which is alkaline, that's basic, that means there's probably carbonate in it. The reason why you know that is because carbonate is alkaline, and that means we have an alkaline pH if carbonate is inside the actual solution. Right? That's your confirmation test. That's the thing you do after your first primary test. Now, after doing the first test, we'll move on to the second test. And the second test, we we're going to check for sulfate. So remember, we're checking for sulfate in our second test. Now, what does it say for the second part? That's the one in green here. It says, add nitric acid plus barium nitrate. Now, why would we add barium nitrate? So barium is the same as Ba2+. Ba2+. So what happens if we add barium nitrate, which will dissolve into its ions, barium and nitrate? What happens if this barium, which is 2+, plus, reacts with sulfate 2-? Well, in this case, we have sulfate ion here. What kind of salt will the sulfate ion form with barium? Well, in this case, sulfate and barium will actually form an insoluble salt. Right? So that means if sulfate and barium come together, that means a precipitate forms. And that precipitate, we, we could be able to observe. Right? So we would observe that. So it says, add nitric acid plus barium nitrate. And if a white precipitate, actually I wrote participate, but it should be precipitate. If a white precipitate appears, what that means is that sulfate has combined with barium, which we've just put inside, we've put some barium inside, to form a barium sulfate, which is a salt. And you can see it says S, small s, for solid, because it's actually a precipitate, and we could observe that with our naked eye. All right, so in this case, we've just done a test, and we've confirmed there's most likely sulfate in that, in that actual solution. Now, that would mean that we have, in the solution itself, we would have these white dots, because these white dots tell us there's a precipitate inside. But for the confirmation test, you don't want to use the actual test that has these white dots in it. You'll use the original solution that is not any, no precipitate inside, right? So if you want to do confirmation tests to confirm your results, what you will do is you'll use, instead of using barium nitrate, which we did in the first test, we're going to use lead nitrate instead. So what we're going to do is we're going to use lead nitrate. That's basically PB, which stands for lead. And nitrate, not that important. It's just part of it, but the PB is the important part. So we're going to add that. PB, that lead nitrate, into that solution. And we're going to observe what happens. And what happens if we have sulfate inside the solution and we have lead inside, this part here. 
Well, that will form sulfate, so lead sulfate, those two will combine. And if you look at here, it's also insoluble. So we will expect a white precipitate to form. So if we add lead nitrate into the solution, and then if a white precipitate appears, what that means is that sulfate has combined with the lead to form lead sulfate, which is solid, so it's a precipitate as well. And that means we know, we have just definitely confirmed that sulfate is in that solution, right? So again, if that happens and we can see his white dots, we know that sulfate is in solution. So that's the second test we did. We've just tested for sulfate. The next test, the third test, we will test for chloride ions. But now we have this actual precipitate in our solution. We want to make sure we don't have the precipitate in the solution. And we do our third test because that would kind of make our results not that reliable. So we want to make sure we remove the actual white precipitate. If it, if it appeared, if it appeared, we want to make sure we remove it. Right? And we can remove that for filtering. Right? So we filter the actual sample with, with test, which is a filter paper, and we're testing only the filtrate. So we're testing stuff that's left over, not those white dots. Right? So we, because we filtered, we've removed those white dots, and then we move on to the third actual test. And the third test, we're adding, we're testing for chloride ions, and the way we do that is we add chloride ions and silver together. So here it says add nitric acid plus silver nitrate. Right? So in this case, silver nitrate, that means Ag plus. Again, the nitrate you can just ignore, but the most important was the Ag plus part. What happens if Ag plus and Cl minus come together? Well, this, te this table here tells us that chloride, which is what we're testing for, and Ag plus, they form a salt which is insoluble. So we would expect an actual white precipitate to form if that was the case, right? So if we put in silver nitrate and a white precipitate forms in the solution, that means that we definitely have, or most likely have chloride in, present in the actual solution, right? Because it reacted with silver to form a visible precipitate. Now as our confirmation test, what we would do next is we would actually grab some 10% ammonia, right? that's a base, grab 10% ammonia and put that ammonia into a solution. And what we were trying to observe is we were trying to observe the precipitate disappearing. Right? So if we put that in solution into the actual precipitated solution, if, that, if we put it inside the ammonia inside the solution, if that stuff disappears, right? the stuff that just disappeared in the first test, if it re disappears in the second test, that's not a confirmation test we can use to show that chloride is actually present. Right? That's our confirmation test for and looking if, if chloride is present. Now for our last one, again, we're going to make sure that our sample we choose is actually precipitate free. If there's precipitate inside, you're going to make sure you filter it out and remove it before you go on to the fourth test, the final test for anions. And for the final test, we're checking if phosphate ions are present. And we're going to do that by adding ammonia, so that's a base, and barium nitrate. So again, we says barium again, like we did with sulfate, so barium 2 plus. So we're going to add barium to our phosphate. So where in that table is barium and phosphate. phosphate? Phosphate is here, and it's insoluble in most except for these. So sodium, potassium, and ammonia, ammonium, but it's insoluble in, for example, barium. So it will become insoluble in barium, which means if we put barium inside, in combination with our ammonia, it will actually form a precipitate. Now this is important. It's important to realize that the precipitate for ammonia, uh, for phosphate, will only appear if we put ammonia and barium nitrate into it, those two combined. And I'm going to go over why that's important in a second. But if you put those two in, and a white precipitate actually appears, what that means is we have our phosphate ion, which is combined with barium ions, to form this barium phosphate salt, which is a solid, thereby being a precipitate, and thereby being visible, and we can see it appear in the actual solution. Now, as a confirmation test, we're going to add ammonium molybdate into the solution, in the solution that has no precipitate in it, and if a yellow precipitate forms, that's not a confirmation test that we can confirm that barium, uh, sorry, that phosphate is actually present. So again, I've just gone through the primary and the confirmation test for all of those four anions. And what I want you to take out of this actual dot point is roughly know why they're doing it, 
understand this table and how this is working when it comes to this actual experiment. And also importantly, know why we're doing that sequence I mentioned earlier. This was part of the sequence. We test for carbonate first, and for sulfate second, and then for phosphate fourth. Now there's something obviously chloride in between it as well in third. But why do we do the sequence? But what would happen if we test them each first? So for example, okay, if we test carbonate first, we know that we put acid inside. And if we put acid inside, the carbonate and the acid react. And these carbonate dots, which are the red ones, these will form carbon dioxide and they will become gas. Right? That happens if we put carbonate test first. What happens if we put the actual test for sulfate, not first, but and not second, but first? Well, now we put both barium, sulf, barium nitrate, so BA, and we put an acid in. We put an acid as well. That's what we do for that test. Put an acid and we put barium in it. So in this case, we're going to have the barium reacting with the sulfate to form a precipitate. So we're going to have the green ones, which are our sulfates. They will react with the barium to form this precipitate. But at the same time, you're also going to have the red ones reacting with the acid, and you're going to have gas appear. So basically, in this case, we have two things happening at one and set in the same time, and it's quite confusing, which is why we do first, we do carbonate test, then we do sulfate test. Not sulfate test first, because otherwise we might get a strange result. And why do we, don't we do the phosphate test? Why do we do the phosphate test after the, carb, uh, the sulfate test? Well, in this case, Again, just imagine we have all this present, and we're doing this test first for the phosphate. Well, what do we do? We add barium and a base. Barium, uh, so this is our barium, and our base was ammonia. We add some ammonia in as well. Now, in this case, if we have ammonia and barium, you're going to have actual phosphate reacting, right? So the barium will only react with sulfate if ammonia is not present. If ammonia is present, it will react with the actual sulfate and with the phosphate. In this case, with barium and ammonia present, we're going to have both the sulfate and the phosphate forming precipitate. They're both going to react because remember here, they both react, they're all both insoluble in barium. So the problem is, if we do this test first before doing the sulfate test, we're going to have two things precipitating. We're going to have both the sulfate and the barium precipitating. And it gives us an inaccurate result. So the reason why we do the, these tests first is due to the first test we do the carbonate test. Again, I mentioned we put the acid inside, and you're going to have the acid reacting with the carbonate to form carbon dioxide. So in our second test, there's going to be no more carbon, carbonate because it's going to be gone. For the second test, we then do our actual um, barium plus acid. We're going to add some barium in it, and we're also going to add some acid in it. And that's going to make only the sulfate react, because remember, we need to have barium plus base for the phosphate to react with barium. But because we only have barium and an acid, we're only going to have the sulfate reacting. So sulfate will react with the barium, so Ba2 plus with this SO4 2 minus, right? And this, in this case, we have the green ones being barium, uh, sorry, being sulfate. So they have reacted to form precipitate, and then we remove that precipitate. By the time we do the next test, they, the precipitate will be gone, so all of the sulfate will be gone. So for the last test, we will theoretically only have phosphate in it. So in this case, now if we add the barium and the base, there's going to be no more problems because all the white, we know that the white precipitate it forms is definitely going to be phosphate because there's no more possibility of sulfate being left. Right? That's why we do it in a sequence as opposed to just doing randomly testing whichever one we want. If we get reliable results if we do it in sequence, we get unreliable results if we don't do it in sequence. So you need to know that as well. Right? So I'll cover the next part of that video now. So the next video, which you can just press on here or move to a playlist and move to the next one. But I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.